Turn in your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God. I want you to melt me, mold me, fill me, spirit of the living God, for into Jeremiah. the Lord with me right there. Come on and clap your hands and worship the Lord with me. Come on and bless his name. Bless his name. We're in the house of the Lord. Let's give him glory. The glory that is due his name. Amen. Somebody say thank you Jesus for saving me. My God. How many have gone through some things and, and, and recognized how amazing the grace of God is. 
uh, you know, he's he's brought us through some things and and uh, and and carried us. And uh, I know, uh, just like my sister said, that that there was a time when I should have been dead, repeatedly. <laughs> but Lord saw fit. The Lord saw fit to spare my life and spare our lives and and keep us in the land of the living for such a time as this, so that we can be matured and grow in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and become his workmanship. Amen. I'm in Jeremiah 18. And if you would with me, we are going to cover the entire chapter tonight. And as it is our custom, we will stand for the reading of the word of God. Amen. <coughs> I'm going to endeavor to move quickly because I know that time has kind of escaped us tonight, but that's all right. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. The word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, Cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I have said I would benefit them. Now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you, and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way, and make your ways and doings good. And they said, There is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices. And we will every one do the imagination of his own evil heart. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, ask ye now among the heathen who hath heard such things. The virgin Israel hath done a very horrible thing. Will a man leave the snow of Lebanon which cometh from the rock of the field? Or shall the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? But my people have forgotten me. They have burned incense to vanity and have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths to walk in paths in a way not cast up. To make their land desolate, a perpetual hissing, everyone that passes thereby shall be astonished and wag his head. I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. Then said they, come, let us devise devices against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor word from the prophet. Come, and let us smite him with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. Give heed to me, O Lord, and hearken to the voice of them that contend with me. Shall evil be recompensed for good? 
for they have digged a pit for my soul. Remember that I stood before thee to speak good for them and to turn away thy wrath from them. Therefore deliver up their children to the famine and pour out their blood by the force of the sword and let their wives be bereaved of their children and be widows and let their men be put to death. Let their young men be slain by the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard from their houses when thou shalt bring a troop suddenly upon them for they have digged a pit to take me and hid snares for my feet. Yet Lord thou knowest all their counsel against me to slay me. Forgive not their iniquity, let neither blot out their sin from thy sight, but let them be overthrown before thee. Deal thus with them in the time of thine anger. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to help me tonight and give me preaching power. God, I'm asking you to help me deliver this word in the clarity that you gave it to me and allow me to step out of the way and let your word be heard and let our hearts be prepared and ears seasoned to hear the word of God. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. This month, as you know, we've been looking at the subject of being a vessel of honor. Submitting ourselves to the sanctification process, that is the process of being perfected by God. And earlier this month, we determined that sanctification is the lifelong process of cooperating with the Holy Spirit to clean up our lives so that we can always be ready to be used by God. How many of you want to be used by God? We said that as we are heading into our anniversary celebrations and the theme, Open the Floodgates, that we're taking some time out. Somebody say, I'm taking some time out. Taking some time out. We're taking time out to examine if we as vessels of God are indeed prepared to receive that which God is going to pour out for us. I know I'm eager to hear what God has to say over next weekend. But I want to take time out to make sure that my vessel is prepared to receive what God is for. We heard a message last week called There's a Hole in the Bucket. (laughs) We learned that God is not in the business of pouring out his blessings, his fresh living water into vessels that are not prepared. And there is no one to blame but ourselves if we are not containing that which God is pouring out, if we have not dealt with the holes in our bucket. Amen. Tonight we're going to take a closer look at the process of how the holes in our bucket get fixed. Amen. Uh, In our text tonight we can see the process of being perfected by God. Being perfected by God is exactly what needs to happen, especially after we have failed at everything else, doing our temporary patch jobs only to make it a few blocks down the road and then have another blowout. Ah. After having done all that you know how to do, God is asking, can I do you like this? Uh God is asking tonight, can I do you? Like this. Here in Jeremiah chapter 18, God told Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house so that God could cause Jeremiah to hear his words. In this sanctification process that we're talking about, it is important to understand that it is essential that we cultivate the hearing of God's voice. Mm-hmm. Now, 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 we need to understand that God is always speaking. But more times than not, we are just way too busy to hear what God is saying. Uh-huh. We, we are admonished in Scripture to be still and know that I am God. But we live in a world that is full of distractions. Amen. If it's not a job, it's family. If it's not family, it's some personal issue. It's friends, it's bills, it's a pretty girl, a fine man. We're talking about distractions. Even church work ranks on this never-ending list of distractions we face every day. But if you are ever 
you're going to be led by the Spirit, you have to find a place of quiet, mm -hmm. a place of refuge, a, a corner in the attic, a, a, a spare room in the house, the front porch, somewhere where you can get alone just to be still before God. Trouble is our flesh, <laughs> this flesh, your flesh, your flesh is clamoring for stimulation. Uh -huh. Our flesh is always looking for the next temporary sensation, amen? But your spirit craves quietness and communion with the Lord. Scripture says to us, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, all of ye that labor, and I will give you rest. God longs to talk with you. God longs to comfort you, to direct you. We, however, must cultivate and train ourselves to be still, that we might hear the voice of God. After you finish praying, there should be a time for you to be quiet before God and allow God to speak to you. What did God say to Jeremiah? God spoke to Jeremiah and told him to arise and I will cause you to hear. He said, arise and I will cause you to hear. So, so why didn't God just tell him what he wanted to tell him right there? Why did Jeremiah have to arise? Well, the fact is that God said arise shows that Jeremiah had to move from one state to another, either mentally or physically. Uh, the, the word arise is an action word that means to become powerful. It means to come on the scene. Uh -huh. uh, so Jeremiah had to arise from a state of repose and move to a state of action. Move from a state of repose to a state of action. And if you are going to ever begin to hear God for yourself, you are going to have to take authority over yourself, come out of your laziness, come out of your apathy, get away from that I don't care attitude, get somewhere to pray so that you can hear God. So that God can cause you to hear his voice. Amen? God often reveals his will to us progressively. You need to know that God is not going to tell you everything he wants to tell you in one sitting. <laughs> He's not going to say it all to you. God, God will tell you what you need to know right now to see what you're going to do with it. Okay? And it's not that he doesn't know what you're going to do with it, but, but God is patient enough to allow you to come to a place of willing obedience a place where you can come to see that is recognize the benefits of your own obedience. He's patient enough to wait on you. That even if he gives you instructions and you don't obey them right away, because he kind of knows what you're going to do. But the thing about it is that the quicker that we obey God, the more he's going to speak to us. Amen? God is patient enough. As Jeremiah obeyed the first command, it was then that further instructions were given. Uh-huh. He says, I will cause thee to hear my words. The word hear means to perceive by ear. And as we are quick to hear and obey the voice of the Lord, God will speak to us more frequently. Okay? But the reason some of us ain't heard from God since the first time we got saved is because quite possibly you ain't been obedient to nothing God said since you got saved. You're walking around, oh, I just can't hear God anymore. <laughs> I, I got no direction. I, I, I feel like my life is just going in circles. Well, have you been obedient to what God told you to do? Or worse, you running around saying, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and you pay your tithes, and you come into church. But you still got no direction. You still can't hear God. Your life is still going in circles. 
-hmm. Because she's not been obedient to anything God has told you to do since she got saved. (laughs) It could be as simple as go to church. Be faithful. Don't let anything get in the way. Listen to your pastor. Be obedient. Read the Bible and do what it says. It could be the Lord wants you to quit smoking, quit drinking, stop the drugs and all the midnight booty calls. It it could be whatever. Tell the truth and stop lying. It could be something simple. But have you ever been obedient to what the instructions of the Lord were? We make a grave mistake in our walk with God when we think we can just do whatever we think is right in our own eyes. When we think, oh, this sin and that sin is not such a big deal. When in reality, our whole relationship with God comes to a standstill when we disobey or ignore the voice of God in our lives. God had a great revelation to share with Jeremiah, which he would have missed if he had not obeyed God's first command. God showed Jeremiah the process of being made by the hands of the great potter. He was able to see how the vessel in God's hand was marred. Uh huh. That word marred, it, it, it means it, it is, it, it's a. The, the word there was Nepal. It, it means to be spoiled, to be corrupted, to be injured, ruined, or, or, or rotted from the core. Some who have been serving the Lord for many, many years think they've got it all together. Like they've made it. They, they can quote scripture, they can sing in the choir, and they're involved with the prayer ministry in the church. But if they could only see what God sees, they might be holding their heads in shame. But see, we are all those vessels. Vessels that are marred in the hands of the potter. And it takes many breakings sometimes so that the sweetness of God's glory can flow through us consistently and unhindered. You say, why does it seem like my life is always broken? shattered in pieces. Sometimes it's like I'm being ground to dust. Baby, you're in the reshaping process. Uh God is breaking you again and making a new vessel out of you. But you should rejoice because no matter how marred you are, rejoice that God is never willing to throw you out. He never casts you aside. He may break you down. He may grind you to dust. But he's making you again. Making you fit for his purposes. And no, the process of being made is not always a pleasant one. Many times we are chastened and corrected over and over again until we figure it out. Until we finally get it, until we finally comprehend what God desires to do in and through us. God's cry is this. Why can I not do with you as the potter does with this clay? Can I do you like this? And God is longing to mold us and make us into what pleases him. We have this treasure in an open vessel. The glory of God rests on us. And as we allow him to deal with us and make us, it is then and only then that God will be glorified through our lives. And just like in the Old Testament times, how they would tie the sacrifices to the altar. Mm Mm-hmm. They were tied to the horns of the altar, waiting to be slaughtered. In the same way, we need to be diligent to remain on the altar and allow the Father's knife to cut away everything that will cause us to be spoiled and corrupted and injured or rotten. Then and only then can we truly be vessels of honor, fit for the Master's use. 
just like the people of Israel. They repeatedly went through cycles. Round and round on the potter's wheel they went. Cycles of laziness and apathy that eventually led them to rebellion and compromise in their relationship to God. Some of us know what it's like being lazy. <laughs> when you want to replace reading your Bible with watching TV. All right, you ain't got to lie. <laughs> I'd like to be proved wrong, but sometimes I feel like some of us, we don't pick up the Bible till we come to church. And we need to ask ourselves what that's all about, really. Uh, you know, we, gotta, we need to develop a, a, a relationship with God and, 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 and not be afraid to pick up the Bible and let God speak to us. Amen. Some of us have lapsed into prayerlessness. And before you know it, you got an attitude. Can't nobody tell you nothing. Your heart is hard again, and before you know it, you're right back doing the same things that you used to do. Doing all the things that had your life wide open for all kinds of spiritual and mental and physical impurity. The things that had your life all messed up in the first place. Uh huh. The Israelites went through this repeatedly, and God would chasten them by allowing their enemies to attack and conquer them, put them in slavery, and got their lives back all messed up again. Back in the same spot that they were in before they left Egypt. Back in bondage. Well, well, come on, come on. In verse 17, it says an interesting thing. God says, I will scatter them with an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. Brother Troy and I had a conversation a few days ago about this and, 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 and I thought it was very interesting that God led me right to this passage of scripture where it talks about it. He told me about how shepherds had to lead their flocks where they needed to go while facing them. You say, you all were the sheep and I was the shepherd. He would face the flock and walk backwards to lead them. Why? So that the sheep could imprint on his face. So that they could recognize that the sheep are, were so short-sighted that they had to be able to, that if he turned his back, they would go astray and become lost and in danger. Even the little lambs of the flock would, it, were in the back. They would, they would leap up. <laughs> To, to try to catch a glimpse of the shepherd's face so they would know which direction to go. Because sheep are so short-sighted, when the shepherd turned his back to them, they would go astray and lose their way and become lost. So what God is saying here is that while the Israelites are in their suffering because of their refusal to hearken to the voice of the Lord through the prophet, that God decided not to show his face to them during this time. The one thing that they needed to gain any sense of direction because of their disobedience, God was leading them to their own devices. The Israelites were experiencing retribution for their unfaithfulness to God. They were reaping what they had sown. God wanted the Israelites to separate themselves from everything that was spiritually impure. That meant not marrying into families that were not the people of God. And it wasn't a racial thing. It was so that wicked ideas and traditions would not infect the hearts and minds of the people of God. And so that they would not get caught up in worshiping other gods. So I'm just going to say this. We are the people of God. We are the people of God. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Jesus is our great shepherd. And we are his sheep. The people of God are to be different. We are to be distinguishable from the people of the world. And this is why the Bible talks about friendship with the world being enmity or being in conflict with God. Holiness is the expectation of God's people. And that's not some kind of half-hearted or casual endeavor. Well, it ought not be that the child of God is getting drunk and getting high just like those who do not know God. It ought not be that the child of God is down at the bathhouse and the bookstores and the truck stops and the park bushes on your knees doing everything but praying like those who do not know God. 
It ought not be that the child of God's mouth is full of lies and hustling and being deceitful and scandalous and trying to uh, get a dollar that you didn't earn. Like those who do not belong to God. It ought not be that the child of God has no regard or respect for the sanctity of marriage or a committed relationship and you putting the moves on one or both of the spouses like perhaps those who do not know God. The sad part is that some of the ones who do not know God act better than the ones who say they do. Verse 13 describes it here too. The Lord said, ask among the heathen. Have you ever heard of such a thing? The ones who don't know God, ask them. The Virgin Israel, the people of God have done a horrible thing. Mm. In the Old Testament, when God separated his people for special purposes, it was under a very strict Nazarite covenant. It was a code that included restrictions on the consumptions of anything made from grapes. Specifically, that meant no wine. Uh There was to be no razor that would touch their heads. They were not to eat any unclean thing. Not having any wine symbolizes sobriety. Uh And no haircut symbolized their submission to God. And refraining from consuming unclean things was a commitment to remain separate from anything that would compromise their purity. Samson, who remembers Samson? Samson was one such man who was under a Nazarite covenant. But Samson was living an inconsistent life. He failed miserably at keeping the covenant that was made between him and God. Of course, at the end of the story, we see the grace of God when Samson, even in his death, is used by God killing 3,000 Philistines after he repented and called again upon the Lord. The Israelites continue this kind of pattern over and over. Rest, rebellion, retribution, repentance, and restoration until it seems like even God at times just gives up and resigns himself from mankind as we see statements in scripture like in those days there was no king in Israel and the people did what was right in their own eyes. Yeah, God backed off of them. He backed off and left them to their own demise when they decided I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. And the Lord is telling me to say this tonight. That many of us right here tonight are in that same place. We are in that rest, that laziness, that won't pray, won't seek God, in rebellion, opposing the pastor, whispering words of discord in the community and among the sheep about the one who is probably about the only voice of God in your life right now. Yeah, just like they did it to Jeremiah. (laughs) In verse 18, they they said, Come, let us devise devices against Jeremiah, for the law shall not perish from the priest, nor the counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, let us smite him with our tongue. Let us not give heed to any of his words. Let's not listen to anything he has to say. And Jeremiah, after trying to do everything he could do to keep them from coming under God's wrath, after he heard that they were now plotting against him, he basically resigned himself too and prayed that God would not forgive them. Prayed to God that their lives would be cursed and asked God to not forgive them. Now, now, I don't know whether Jeremiah was within his rights to pray that prayer or not, but it's clear that he was comfortable enough in his relationship with God to do so. Hmm. to ask God he's so evil so and so don't forgive him God <laughs> let him be cursed let him die let their blood run in the streets he was pretty uh, he said some things Amen. and because many of us still have not hearkened unto the word of the Lord even the word of the Lord that has come forth in this house some of us we are in this retribution stage we're reaping what we have sown and God 
is allowing the enemy to have his way with you. And you're fighting and you're fighting and you're fighting, trying to get back into the place in life where God's blessings are flowing instead of running to God. You're running to your addictions. You're running to a man or to a woman trying to take the edge off. You resist the word of God and you refuse to repent so God can restore you. You won't set a standard to stay clean and sober in your life or submit yourself to the ways of God. You're not willing to separate yourself from the things that contaminate your relationship with God. You won't obey what God has told you to do. So right there you sit in bondage, enslaved, defeated. Oh, I just wish my life would get better. Yeah, you might want to whip out 1 Corinthians 10 and 23 on me and say, all things are lawful, but not to me all things are, are, are not expedient. But I need you to understand something to you tonight. Look here. There wasn't anything particularly unholy about Samson having short hair. Get me on this. There wasn't anything particularly unholy about wearing clothes that were woven of two fabrics like the Bible instructed the Israelites not to do. I mean, really, if you read through Leviticus and see, and see all the stuff that was considered unclean and wearing a garment woven of two fabrics was forbidden. And some of the fashionistas in the room tonight might agree that polyester suits are a work of the devil. <laughs> but it was not those specific things that were unholy in of themselves. It was about the covenant and the relationship and the individuals or the people's willingness to honor the connection they had with God. In other words, because God said so, I'm going to do it. Samson lost his connection to God's power when he allowed his hair to be cut. But it wasn't because he had short hair. It was because it was the result of his carelessness and allowing himself to be overwhelmed by his fleshly desires for beautiful women. It was his undoing. Uh -huh. It was not about mixing fabrics that was in of itself unholy. It was the lesson to be learned about taking seriously, being set apart by God, and not allowing people and the world to dilute or pollute the quality of your relationship to God with wickedness, with false teaching, with nonchalance. Be it drinking or drugs or promiscuous sex, lying, stealing, hateful, selfish attitudes, whatever it is, you know within yourself what God has been trying to get at. You know within yourself what you have been avoiding and sweeping under the rug trying to move on pretending like everything is all right. You have been under the word long enough to know in your own life. I'm not talking about everybody else's life. I'm talking about your life. In your life, this is what God has been trying to get at. We all got something. We all got something that we've been holding back on God, that we realize that we are marred in the hands of God. And he's saying to us, can I do you like this? Can I do you like this? But every time God starts to get at it, every time God wants to work it out of you, you jump off the wheel. And in essence, you're saying to God, anything but that, God. I'll give you whatever you want, but, but that. Oh, Jesus, I'm glad you saved me, and I, and I get to be counted among the saints. But I think this is as far as we're going to be able to go. Because I just can't, I can't, I just can't let go of my drinking, I, I, my drugging, I, and my midnight booty calls. I can't just let it go. I just can't let go of that music I listen to that ain't nothing about sex and, and death and cursing the name of God. I, I can't just let go of my, my cigarettes, my K2, and my blunts, and, and those TV shows that fill my head with all the ideas that are contrary to the will of God. But God, but God knows better. And God is not willing to put a marred vessel into the fire as a completed work. He knows that if he puts you into the fire right now, your imperfections will cause you to be permanently cracked. So he says, 
can I do you like this? Can I, like the potter that breaks that imperfect vessel and starts all over again, start all over again making a new vessel out of you? Can I do you like this? From that place of brokenness, will you yield yourself in humility to my hands? Will you repent? Will you change your mind? Will you change your direction? And let me make you over. God's cry tonight is this. Can I do you like this? Can I do with you as the potter does with his clay? Will you let me mold you? Will you let me make you? Will you let me shape you? Will you let me fashion you by my word? Will you let me work out the imperfections in your life? It takes submission. You got to see yourself as that lump of clay. And what's the, what's the funny part about it? If you really take the analogy to its literal sense, a piece of clay does not have a mind of its own. A piece of clay cannot shape itself and make itself into anything. We must allow the hand of God to shape us. The difference is we are human beings. God has given us a mind, a will, and emotions. So, in order for us to be on God's potter's wheel, we must decide. We must yield ourselves and say, God, have your way in my life. And I guarantee to you, he'll mold you. He'll make you. He'll fashion you by his word. Get into the quiet place. Listen to the voice of God. And don't be afraid that when he says, he gets that little putty knife and starts to, we're going to cut this off. Okay, God, I know it's going to hurt a little bit, but we're going to let that go. We're going to let that go. God is looking for vessels. He's looking in his cabinet for vessels that he can fill so that they can be poured out. Will you be a vessel of honor? Will you allow God to shape you? Will you allow God to mold you so that you can be used of God? All that stuff that was messing up our lives, it is not worth your time. Let it go. Let it go. And be free in the name of Jesus.